learning spaces. In particular, the precise plan needs to address the use of flex zones, particularly items like awnings, expanded seating areas, and lighting. All are elements that bring charm as well as utility and safety to downtown, which are essential to its growth and vibrancy. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. It doesn't look like there are any other speakers. We'll bring it back to the commission. All right. Um, so, it's first um, questions from commissioners um, before we get in and get into a discussion. So, any uh, questions from commissioners on uh, before we move on to detailed discussion? Uh, I can kick us off. Um, maybe the first one is just building off of the public comment. Is it possible to go through those eight buildings that were considered to be historic? Is that a detail that could be provided to Ms. Katz? Um, yeah, I mean, I think with the, the uh, caveat here, I can, I can bring those up and I can list them. The caveat here is that uh, the purpose of the study was to determine whether there were uh, a significant number of buildings to meet the threshold of an historic district. Um, and even the attachment to the letter from the Livable Mountain View had that um, kind of definition, right? To do, are there a significant number of buildings with enough integrity to be uh, uh, to be uh, related to the period of historic significance for downtown. Um, and so um, given that we found that it was not a historic district, we did not go through and uh, thoroughly vet the specific buildings that were identified. Uh, there was enough possible variation in, in interpretation of which ones could or couldn't be um, that I wouldn't say that there are only eight that qualify, or I wouldn't say that all eight would qualify. Um, but I wanted to give that caveat. And if you'll just give me a second, I'll get the document open and I can I can find it. But it's, it might take me a second to get it open, um, unless Edgar or uh, Rick has an older has the the survey already open. If not, I can get it open and you can go on to another question. I understand entirely. I think the other part of the speaker's question in some ways was, does the city have, could city council have the discretion if not to meet these other standards, right? Are there, there city level standards that could, I don't want to say preempt, but could, could define that historic zone in some other way. Um, Yeah, we, I mean, we looked at all different kinds of ways to define historic areas. Um, the one with the most kind of comprehensive protection of, um, you know, buildings within the area is the statutorily defined historic district. Um, that's not to say that we don't already have those protections over all the historic buildings in our district. It just doesn't apply to other buildings. Several blocks, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the example that she gave, the Walheimer building, mm -hmm. you know, is certainly protected um, it, given that it is certainly a historic building and anybody like, um, like Mr. Maravilla said earlier, anybody coming in and proposing to affect it in a way that would impact it as a cultural resource uh, would have to go through this EIR process and the city would have full discretion to approve or deny whatever uh, whatever came out of that process. Sorry, I know I've distracted you from pulling up the list, which is less important to me, but I, I just I do feel like if there's a question about transparency, I'm sure the due diligence is done. Yeah. Maybe while you're pulling that, I guess a kind of a related question on that. Can you comment specifically about these 
just are two designations that uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Katz mentioned. Like Los Angeles is using and uh, other cities. Look at that at all. We, uh, I, I can't speak towards what, um, uh, what other specific cities uh, adopted or, or developed. Uh, our consultants looked at several different options with several different examples and identified these targeted updates to the downtown precise plan as the, um, the best option for the city of Mountain View for this for this district. Um, but I don't know, uh, Rick, you have any additional information about other historic districts in other cities? Well, I think the measuring the measuring stick that the consultant used is that while something might have a local designation, she they used Trainer HL, which has done numerous historic surveys for the city of Mountain View over time. Uh, what they used for uh, their measuring stick is uh, both the state and federal criteria for uh, for historic designations. And so, while they were looking at they they were looking to measure how many buildings in a way to begin to define a district, you have to also understand that many of the buildings over time have had extensive renovation done, not just historic ones, others that have a lot of character and create the character of the downtown. But because they have had extensive renovation over time, then they don't uh, meet the state or federal standards for a historic designation. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't have a fantastic downtown with great character. It it just doesn't meet the criteria for a district because it isn't uh, the integrity of all of the downtown isn't of that particular time. So uh, it's so she also noted in many of the conversations that we were at what she was attempting to do. And what you're attempting to do at defining a district is to be able to set up a set of rules and policies. And in fact, the downtown precise plan, in essence, if we bolster the standards and guidelines of the district, we'll be able to protect the fabric of, of the district, of the area, without actually having that historic district designation. And she felt confident that it was a good replacement for that designation. And so we're working closely with them on the development of the actual standards and guidelines so that we, in essence, get the teeth in the standards so that you can maintain uh, the character of the area as, you, as everybody has desired. And, and we understand that. Uh, regardless of a historic district or not, there still be the ability to, for some new buildings to be constructed. And we can develop standards for those new buildings, such as the massing and the step downs and the heights, et cetera, so that uh, those buildings also respect the character of the area in the downtown uh, and respect particularly those buildings that have a historic designation, but also have the character and quality for all of the buildings in the, in the downtown area. So uh, that is kind of the strategy that we're, we have been suggesting to move forward with. And, and we feel that it confidently that uh, with these updated standards and guidelines, that we'll be able to maintain the character and improve the character and enhance it over time. And I'll just also add that within the scope of the downtown precise plan, um, uh, we're, we're somewhat limited 
uh, the a lot of work in order to kind of create kind of more complex uh, historic um, kind of uh, review and historic incentives and things like that has to happen at the level of the city code. It can't really happen at the level of the precise plan because we would want it to apply across all um, uh, across all historic properties in the city. I did find the list. I can go through it real quick. Um, we have the 938 Villa, Wilheimer House, Shea TJ, 954 Villa, Air Base Laundry, uh, Tide House. Uh, we have uh, 124 Castro, the Wilheimer Store, uh, 169 Castro, the Ames Building, 191 Castro, uh, 194 Castro, um, 201 Castro, 275 Castro. Um, am I way over eight here? I feel like I'm way over eight, but maybe it's just eight in area H was the reference because there's all nine. two in area A. Um, okay. But so we've got 201 Castro, 275 Castro, 292 Castro, and 301 Castro. Chair Pinson, do you want to keep the questions on the historic preservation part and then do you I, that um, I just wanted to make sure we get you got your question answered. I did. Then, the rest of my questions are, are related to other parts. So if folks want to continue on historic preservation, I'm glad to yield. Um, the other folks have specific historic preservation questions? Uh, Commissioner Ian or Vice Chair Will? Sure. Um, uh, one question is effectively what, and this is just to enlighten me, what is the, the, the buildings that you named, those are buildings that have already been registered as historic uh, officially? Is that what the list is of the eight plus? So the, the list that I just gave was from the draft survey that we conducted in order to determine whether the area qualified as a district under state or federal standards. Um, these sites have not been fully vetted through staff. Um, you know, we know that this is about the right number of sites. There may be some other marginal sites that could also be included. Uh, maybe some more analysis on these sites may find that they don't fully have the right integrity. Um, again, we, this is not a, a thorough analysis that would result in, for example, a register. This is a, a first pass. Uh, we do have a register. We also have a list of other identified uh, potential historic resources in the city, and all of these things would be uh, protected under CEQA. Okay, and just to confirm, when Pretty had asked, uh, a city council could also designate a district, not just the owners coming forward to put themselves on and yeah, we don't ask for it. We don't have a uh, anything defined in our ordinance that says what a a local district like. What are the qualifications for a local district? Um, so we would only be using the state and federal standards for what qualifies for a district under the state and federal standards. Okay, so state, okay. So local history then for now is off the table because we don't have a set of standards. No, 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 the state and federal standards do take into account local history. It's, okay, it's, it's just their standards. Yeah, if we wanted to say something different than a significant number of, um, of resources from the time of historic, you know, with integrity from the time of, of historic relevance or whatever those standards are in the state and federal um, kind of what makes a historic district. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to say something else, we would have to adopt it through a local ordinance. Got it, okay. And so the, the crux of the issue then, um, I believe uh, Mr. Williams, you had explained that you felt that the development standards might be able to not take place of, but it would, would act almost equally as 
having a historic district designated? Is, is that yes. what you were intending to say? Okay, so. That, that, I, I'm, I'm suggesting without having a historic district, you can still maintain the character of your downtown through the appropriate set of standards and design guidelines predominantly with standards that relate to all of the buildings versus just those that are potentially uh, able to be designated from a historic standpoint. Um, I'll, I'll also just say that even a building that's registered, even though uh, it would be of great effort, uh, it's not that some of those are not sometimes removed from uh, a community. So, uh, but the CEQA process requires uh, substantial evaluation of a building and then the determination that it has overriding considerations that allows the council to make that decision if they so choose at some time. So I think that the CEQA, between CEQA those, those buildings that could be designated uh, historic. But the standards, which you're really trying to accomplish here, I believe, is to have as much substantive uh, integrity to your downtown and have as much control over the regulations and the standards. And there is a lot of, there's a little more squishiness in state and federal historic standards than you would like, to, everyone might like to admit. Uh, we do a lot of, we've done a number of historic landmark building renovations, et cetera, um, in working with the state in great detail. But I think that if you want to, it, but we believe that with these new standards and guidelines, it will get to the point that you're trying to do, which is to substantially uh, incentivize the development community, property owners, facades, improvements, et cetera, to, um, to be of the quality and character that you desire in your community. Okay, well, on that note, and I'll, I'll try not to take too much time, I just wanna be, uh, I just wanna understand clearly. Uh, what I read in the staff report, it said that the recommendation um, would not preserve individual non-historic buildings. So even if we move in that the direction, it was noted that it could not preserve individual non-historic buildings. So I guess I'm trying to understand then what's a non-historic building and which ones that are at risk. I, I guess I'm just not clear in understanding what's at risk currently right now in downtown area A, G, and H. So, so I mean, there's lots of different levels of what at risk is. I, I actually don't think there are very many buildings at risk from the sense of, I think, I don't think they're eminently thought of as being removed. Um, there's lots of factors that go into the potential of a building, the uh, property being redeveloped. Uh, I did find the, the map that kind of mapped out the various buildings that they thought in areas A, G, and H that were uh, potentially um, significant. Um, but most of the buildings in downtown in areas, uh, in area H specifically, mm -hmm. which are very small, um, would be difficult to redevelop. And with other controls that are already in place as part of the downtown plan, would not provide great incentive for somebody to remove an existing building and try to put a new building in its place. Uh, okay, from so, what I understand, I just thought there was a push to aggregate parcels, in fact, and try to rebuild. We, we haven't seen that. Uh, we looked at the ownership pattern within, the, within area A, and H, we didn't find any ownership pattern that suggests uh, aggregation is forthcoming in any way. We didn't see more than one or two sites that actually are owned by the same property ownership groups. So uh, we don't. It would, we would not anticipate that being a substantial pattern of 
of future development. Almost all the buildings kind of have a series of individual property owners that have various interests, few of which when we spoke to any of them were thinking of doing any major development of their sites. Okay, I guess I just have in mind the, the last one, which was the Tide House, the Air Base Laundry and the Wallhammer House. Those were different property owners and they were going to combine together to do a huge office development. Yeah. So that there, was the last one. That is, that is the one that is, I think, triggered all of this conversation. And, and uh, but over the entire area, that might be kind of the only ones. There's a few other sites within the area that are relatively vacant, don't have a substantive building on them right now, or don't have a building of any character that might be considered for redevelopment in the future, but um, they aren't on Castro Street necessarily, and they don't necessarily, um, they wouldn't impact the character of Castro Street in that way. Okay, well, I'll reserve discussion for discussion time. Um, as far as questions, then, um, I guess that's it for now. Thank you. Vice Chair Lowe. Thank you. Um, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions regarding um, the historic district destination. Um, does the destination imply that there may be state or federal funding for preservation of these buildings? So, um, if I understand your question correctly here, Vice uh, Chair Lowe, well, um, you're asking if a building or resource is uh, historic at the state or national level, would they qualify for grants? Yeah. Yeah, that, that is that is correct. Um, there is a special grants by way of the state or, or the um, national register that you could qualify for. Indeed, if your uh, you know, your structure, your resource is historic at the state or national level, uh, which would only be available for state or national level uh, historic resources and not necessarily available for local historic resources. Got it. So for the local um, historic buildings, does the city currently have any investment or incentives to help owners of those buildings with upkeep of you know, the facade and other aspects to preserve the historic characters of these buildings? Yes, uh, so specifically on uh, page eight of the staff report, uh, staff calls out all the benefits by way of the local historic ordinance, which includes things such as uh, variances, exemptions from non-conforming uses and structures, uh, particularly specific to uh, area A, G, and H would be exemptions from requirements of the downtown precise plan. Um, so if your building is locally historic, it, it, this would also apply for, for state um, or national historic structures. Um, our local ordinance uh, provides incentives for all historic resources. Uh, the state and uh, national register only provides incentives for state or national resources. And I'll also just add the uh, property tax reductions yeah. that were eligible for local historic resources. That's the major financial benefit that they have it designated as the tax benefit. They're actually uh, having done a number of historic renovations accessing funds for historic structures is exceedingly complicated detailed and scrutinized and unfortunately most of the buildings here are, are very very small and the amount of administration that it takes for a property owner to um, attempt to access some of the funding sources uh, is very difficult, uh, very challenging. Um, it's not that it can't be done, it's just very extremely challenging. They really have to want to do it. And then the sources of funds are limited, and then they uh, 
they have to basically be used for very specific upgrades. So what you typically find when people are doing historic renovations of major landmark buildings is that they're relatively large in scale and they are able to access funds at a fairly large scale and it covers the administrative costs that are associated with it. And we had a long conversation with our with the historic consultant on this and that was their experience most of these are very small buildings and uh and so there's li there's just limited uh funds available for these types of small interventions that would take place to improve the facades etc on these smaller buildings it would be a challenge just to be honest mm -hmm. yeah got it um so, I mean, maybe this is a discussion item, but I'm wondering if the city has considered setting aside money to help these owners, yes. since this is such an important asset for the city. Um, if the owners have, you know, uh, limited resources to be able to put in, in preserving these um, historic features of the buildings, uh, whether the city has any other role to play to help them out. So um, I believe the uh, um, the city code, and I'm just double checking in the because I think we had it in the staff report. Um, um, yeah, I mean there are kind of credits for different fees and and other requirements, uh, which may come into play if you're trying to rehabilitate a building for a new use, for example. Uh, or for um, some other use on the site. Um, the, um, there, uh, the, I don't believe the city has adopted a fund in the past for this purpose. Uh, but again, I do kind of want to, you know, reconfirm that, you know, there are uh, property tax uh, uh, programs uh, property tax rebate programs, even through the city over and above the Mills Act property tax reductions um, that uh, are part of the city code and, and we can continue to uh, develop and rely upon. If that's something that the city council, uh, the, the EPC wants to recommend that we look into, uh, we could, but we would have to identify funding sources for it as well. Thank you. I'll just mention on that, just extended it. That was facade improvement programs are very popular back in the 70s and the 80s. There were lots of them in different various towns. They usually had little small thresholds of value from a couple of hours of consultant improve, uh, consultant consultation for color selections, awning types, how to fix up the windows, things like that, to maybe a five to 10 to $25,000 grant. But major investment on a facade improvement to the tune of $200,000 or something to that, in that kind of budgetary realm, which is what most would take, would be a pretty substantial, um, a pretty substantial uh, fund to be able to administer. Um, but that, we, we did do some uh, outline uh, ideas about what that might look like from a cost standpoint, but the costs are fairly substantial uh, now to you know, make construction improvements to a facade of a building. So, but if it's just painting or something like that, those were kind of low level, low hanging fruit potentially, but um, those are the challenges with those, those programs today versus in the eighties. Thank you. Commissioner um, Music. I just have one question, um, and forgive my perhaps um, my uh, not knowing this, but even if the whole district itself is not designated as historic, individual buildings within within the downtown could still go through the historic designation process. Is that correct? Moving forward. 
Right, and, and effectively already are, given that they've already been identified. Okay, okay. Um, and I had a question I forgot. In, the, um, in one of the public comments, it mentions that the precise plan already designates Area H as a historic retail district. Um, what does that mean in the context of the precise plan? So, for that area. Yeah, so, so that is correct. The downtown precise plan already calls Castro Street as the uh, historic retail area. So that is a, a local designation. Um, that, not to be confused uh, with a state or national historic district. Um, th those are only, uh, can only be done if you meet the qualifications of the state or the national register, which according to um, you know, trainer and our consultant who did the survey of downtown, we did not meet those requirements uh, of the state or the national register. Uh, however, uh, locally, we have that uh, historic district retail, if I may call it almost an overlay that only applies to the uh, downtown precise plan. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just further clarify, thanks, uh, Mr. Maravilla. Um, I'll just further clarify that it, you know, in order to implement it as a historic preservation device, it would need to be in the city code. We would need to have rules about what that means. Right now, it's just a name. It's just a title uh, because there are no rules about what that means. Um, so um, it is acting, as Mr. Maravilla said, as a tool to uh, encourage and require character defining features on buildings in a way that references the historic, um, the history of the district. Any other questions on historic before we open up to other questions? Um, Commissioner Yin, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, thank you. Just one last question. So. Because we're going, we're trying to meet, we'd have to meet state or federal definitions. We don't have a local set of requirements. Otherwise, it would have to be in the city code, and we don't have that. Then, right now, the suggestion is that we rely on development standards to ensure that the historic, what, what the precise plan calls the retail historic district to remain sort of that characteristic, we we'll rely on development standards, which if I recall in the ULI report, Exhibit 4, had said that it is very difficult to mimic what is organic and naturally done over decades and decades. But if I'm hearing all the discussion correctly, if we don't have protections other than Okay, maybe this is what I'm not getting right. If it's not designated historic, we have CEQA. And then if it undergoes CEQA review, who is the determinant of whether or not it is historic? Is it council? Has the law say? Or is there another sort of expert group that understands historic architecture going to make a call? Oh. If there is a possibility that it might be an historic resource, mm -hmm. right, that would trigger the potential significant impact. And then the EIR becomes the, um, uh, the kind of venue for that discussion, right? So we have experts that we hire that would make a determination about whether it actually is. Um, and then those experts uh, those expert findings would be publicly disclosed and there would be a public comment period and there would be an opportunity to receive that public comment on the EIR as well. So it is a discussion with the public through the EIR, that's the process. Um, but if it is a newer building or if it is clearly a building that does not have um, the integrity of an historic resource, then no, we wouldn't do an EIR and we wouldn't have that conversation and 
and we we would usually determine that based on these surveys that we do periodically who would go through and say no that one's definitely not definitely not so if we go through an EIR, then it's up to the public to demonstrate that they feel a certain way and then up to city council to say yay or nay that this project will go through. Usually what ends up happening is that it's very conservative, that yes, it, it is a historic resource if there's any possibility that it's a historic resource. Um, and then it's up to the city council knowing that it's an historic resource to make the decision about uh, whether to impact the resource, either by demolition or changes to the facade or whatever might impact the historic resource. Uh, the city council has, um, you know, full discretion. Uh, and again, I'm saying city council, there, you know, there, are, there may be cases where this type of decision could be in front of the zoning administrator, but the zoning administrator would more than likely not approve it or would tee it up to directly to the city council. So um, these questions would be before the city. It would be fully within the city's discretion to uh, uh, to deny the project uh, if it is shown that it does have an impact on the resource. Okay, and then according to state law, if it's a residential building, then there's even less ability to potentially save something that is considered non-historic that is defined by well, the, a consultant. Yeah, there are uh, yeah, there are a number of state laws that provide that make it um, uh, that that reduce the city's ability to apply development standards. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also state laws uh, that have what's called ministerial review, which means that there is no discretion um, for certain residential projects. But I think under those state laws, though they specifically exempt projects that are going to impact a historic resource. So Correct. even even in those cases, you wouldn't have the 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 project impacting the historic resource. Now you're asking about this hypothetical case where there might be some disagreement about whether it's a historic resource and the, um, the technical findings are that it is not an historic resource. And then they would be able to go through and would have certain rights under um, possibly even under SB 35 or would um, could um, could uh, force the city to make denial findings uh, for other projects, uh, which is often um, hard to do or, or puts the city in an uh, uh, which is often uh, not a, uh, a path that the city takes, right? Um, so under those circumstances, um, if you have a uh, a technical um, study that says that this is not a historic resource for this, this, and this reasons. Yeah, we would rely on those those professional technical findings. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, questions on other topics? I think Commissioner Heimeyer had some. Nice enough to defer to uh, historical questions for a while. Do you have other questions you wanted to bring forward, Mr. Hammond? Sure. And I guess I just want to clarify a little bit on the sequencing because I understand that we're really early on in this process and there are pieces that are happening that are related to this. But I spent many years on the downtown committee, so forgive me for asking the parking question. But parking is going to be phase two, right? So at this point, that's not in our scope. Really, what we're looking at is are the three things that um, Edgar and Eric had mentioned up front, right? In terms of the sequencing of the transit master plan and Moffat, is there anything that you can tell us in terms of timing or if, if I think the North Moffat area would eventually be considered for some of these same standards that we're, we're potentially discussing tonight? 
Uh, so we don't know the timing of a future Moffitt precise plan. Um, I know council asked for a study session in uh, the next few months, probably in fall, uh, to talk about what their expectations might be for a Moffitt area precise plan. So again, we don't even know what the scope of the project would be, so we can't really put a timeline on it. Um, this uh, phase two will probably follow uh, this phase one and then also the uh, downtown parking strategy, which is currently underway and expected to be done in the fall. So depending on the timing for this, um, you know, a phase two could, could start in 2022. And then what about the transit center? Because I, I just don't know how we really talk about I, I, I guess my point is I don't know how we have a conversation at some point about circulation without thinking about how these things interact. And I know that's not on the agenda tonight. So I want to be really respectful of that. Well, the transit center master plan has a pretty uh, well-developed circulation plan that's actually moving forward. Um, oh, okay. Putting, putting the... Um, you know, pedestrian access under the tracks and, you know, moving vehicle access over to Evelyn so that it can ramp up to, to shoreline. Sure. Um, so all of that is, is pretty well developed. I think the later stages of the Transit Center Master Plan, which is not, uh, uh, which has not been very well developed, are the characteristics of a potential development or public-private partnership on the Transit Center site. But yeah, we are moving forward on all of those different aspects of the transit center master plan as, as far as circulation goes. Great. Uh, and then I, oh, please. Hi, Polly. I was going to say, Eric, you might want to also mention the pedestrian uh, mall, Castro Street pedestrian uh, space design efforts that are going on separate from this so that because people commented on it in, pub, in the public as well. Yeah, so that's certainly something that's going on as well. And I believe in the uh, council answers, we gave uh, a timeline for that. And I'll just pull that up right now. Okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's great. I mean, I, I think that's what's so rare about like the North Bay Shore East Wisman was the opportunity to really imagine everything in a particular area that's relatively independent of multiple parallel processes. And this is unique in that way. Yeah, so the next step with the PED master plan is supposed to be the by by the end of the year, basically, we'll have a report to the city on kind of what um, what that could entail. And then my last question, which again, feel free to tell me this is beyond the scope, but one of the, as I was reading the staff report and thinking about this, I mean, if there are new standards, um, um, that are allowed to help clarify some of the, you know, the look and feel, compatibility, all of those things. Is there any tool, and maybe this is more the downtown committee, maybe it's the, the city council, where as properties are getting redeveloped, that existing business tenants maybe are offered or somehow partnered or connected to redevelop space? Because um, one of the things, I think, I don't know if there's an opportunity to leapfrog, right, but so... Forgive the example, but Dame Street Racing Company, there's a big three-story development that's happening across the street. Is there an opportunity to at least connect, you know, some of the businesses where their leases are expiring and potentially their site stands for redevelopment under these new standards um, to be connected to the future development? Is that the Chamber of Commerce? Is that, like, what, what tools potentially exist in our toolkit to, to preserve long-standing downtown businesses um, as new development comes online and potentially... They're seeking ground floor activation, but but kind of a right of first refusal to downtown businesses um, who are already there and could face displacement. I know that's not the planning commission role. Well, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. It, 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 um, so we don't currently have, for example, a business displacement program, but. Um, you know, if, if that's something that the city is interested in, in looking into, we, you know, there, there are certainly paths to make that type of thing happen, and, and certainly other cities do it. Um, I would also say that that's part of the role of our economic development division, um, is to kind of manage those relationships and look for those kinds of opportunities. 
Um, and then also, like you said, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Downtown um, Business Association, the, um, you know, all kinds of other organizations are acting on behalf of uh, downtown businesses. And you call that a, a business replacement policy or what oh, was displacement? There's a displacement. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I heard replacement. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Ian? No. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Commissioner Haymeyer's question just led me to a, a sort of part B to hers about the transit center. I, I know that a lot of work has gone into the, the circulation. I was wondering when the studies would start, like schedule wise, when they would start talking about the vision of what it would be and what it would look like urban design wise in the connection and stitching it to downtown since, you know, area A, H and G are right there. Yeah. Um... I don't have uh, detailed information about next steps for the project, um, but certainly um, it's something that I think I can follow up on and, and report back more comprehensively, maybe with the public, you know, with the next steps for this project. Questions for other commissioners and other elements before we get into discussion? We have just a question, question for Mr. Williams, uh, you mentioned these programs that you've seen in the past, um, you know, smaller scale than, than full renovations, but did they work? And were they utilized by the, by the smaller cities? No, this was very popular in the 70s and 80s with the Main Street programs. There were small government grants that were, that were provided and uh, I would say generally they were, um, they were somewhat successful. Um, they were still tough to administer um, and they wouldn't do much more than add some awnings and get a new paint job on the facade. But the other thing that they would do is provide a few hours of consultant uh, efforts and expertise to kind of help them not do something bad by doing it even less expensively, like remove all the, the old window panes because they're old and you wanted something new um, to try to maintain those and enhance those. I think you have design standards that kind of go to that effort. Um, so I think that the, the issue of those programs was they were they were pretty successful in a small scale to do small facade improvements in a cost-effective kind of do-it-yourself maintenance manner to, up, to, to upgrade maintenance, but they weren't going to significantly uh, improve the whole systems of buildings, et cetera. So uh, they, they can do a little bit to, to help clean up and get the right types of doors on New, on building facades and protect the existing window fabric systems and things like that, but not, uh, they wouldn't do substantial renovation efforts. Um, just small, small decorative things generally. And, and they were generally, generally fairly successful. So in the staff report, one of the comments was many building owners have long, long time owners that may not have a desire to make substantial modifications it doesn't yield a basically an ROI. So it sounds like you're saying these kind of programs would not necessarily address that, but might help in smaller scale renovations that they want to do. Yes, you have you have a unique group of you know you have a great group of individual property owners that own individual buildings that have been doing pretty well over the last 20 years and you've seen a lot of success and you have some unique uses in them. Um, but they don't, they, because they're also a lot, a lot of long-term owners, they don't necessarily have the incentive to do a, large, a lot of large upgrades and put that kind of effort into their property. Some do, some don't, um, but, but small scale facade improvements are generally what they do. And they're usually triggered by 
tenants changing and things like that. So you might see a little bit more of that happening since you do have some additional vacancies in the downtown right now due to COVID. And you'll see a burst of energy, positive energy at people fixing things up after as they continue to open up in the next year or so. I would, I'm, I'm expecting that. And um, another question without any. And, and the standards that you talked about, um, none of them at this point really talk about landscape. And one of the speakers spoke about the fact that some areas of downtown are, you know, tree lined, lots of, you know, very green, and other side streets aren't that way. Do you, are you envisioning that we would include these, wouldn't just be setbacks and things like that, but that you would be including? things like streetscapes and to try to get more of that, that green downtown in place? Um, or is that just something we need to tell you, we'd like you to do that? Um, well, well, I think that um, one of the reasons I mentioned the kind of pedestrian mall, pedestrian zone uh, efforts going on in parallel is that there is another uh, planning effort that uh, Eric just mentioned is gonna be done uh, some recommendations are going to be put forth by the end of the year, um, which are about the public right-of-way enhancements, which will, I would anticipate, would include landscaping and trees and pedestrian zones. And so that is working in conjunction with the building envelopes and the private development property. Um, so uh, we're anticipating these both being somewhat completed, not simultaneously. This might be a little bit ahead, but it might be very, very close to the same time. Um, so that that effort, which would be incorporate such things as street trees and lighting and uh, changes to the sidewalks and landscaping and stuff that's in the public right of way, will all will probably happen in conjunction and in parallel with this effort. Separate but parallel. That's the pedestrian mall piece, or yeah, I, yeah, I think that's what Rick's referring to as the pedestrian mall. Yeah. Um, but I, again, I want to reemphasize that you know, council's direction for this phase was of limited scope, um, and that the, you know, that's kind of what we're tasked to do. We're not tasked to look at public rights of way. Uh, I think that's a much larger, more complex um, uh, task that we're, we're not scoped to do right now, although I could absolutely see it being part of phase two. Like looking at other streets, you know, we are focusing a lot with Castro Street, the pedestrian uh, streetscape, but we could very well, you know, reimagine Hope Street, reimagine uh, California Street, you know, and, and kind of what those rights of way look like, but in a, in a little Dana is within our scope, right? Uh, yeah, all of those streets are, are in the scope, but I just want to say that um, it's, it's one thing to look at zoning standards when you are applying it to private property, building envelope, you know, design, and, um, you know, historic preservation and, and uses. It's, a, it's another thing entirely to look at the needs and capacity of public rights of way because you're looking at potential circulation vehicle circulation issues you're looking at uh parking you're looking at um possibly utilities and all of those complex things in the public right of way we're not scoped to be looking at and then uh, my last question about the other folks i mentioned when our in our brief call, you had called out um, AB 1401 as something that might affect us. Did you identify any other current bills that you think that we should be conscious of or that you're, you'd be concerned about? Or I just, it was the rest of the commission, I was surprised that a, a bill that has only made it through two committees and has not even made it to the assembly floor was called out as something for us to consider. And I didn't know, just, I raised the question in my mind, is that are they, they have concern that that was particularly likely to pass? And that led, led to the question of, is there anything else like that uh, that we should be conscious of? 
Um, I th we, we included that in the uh, staff report just because it was, um, uh, you know, unlike the one that kind of has been kind of talked about for the last couple of years, the, the one that you talked about in our private meeting about the commercial conversion, which is really about kind of strip mall conversions to residential. Um, this was one that's, that uh, has just kind of come up this year. And so we just want to kind of make sure that everybody's aware of it. Um, it's not, uh, at this point, we don't have any reason to believe that it's any more or less likely than, you know, the commercial conversion one that you and I were talking about. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Capillas, you haven't had a chance to speak yet. So, <clears throat> those of us who've worked on precise plans for some time to work on just a portion and have all of the, you know, kind of parallel project around us kind of makes this a little bit more challenging from, from my perspective. So, it would be helpful um, to me personally for you to um, set expectations of what you really want from us this evening because we you know I think it's even confusing um, from the public feedback point of view because we've gotten uh, so many different concerns and issues that we're brought forward and I'm not sure if that is really in our area of feedback uh, to give to you but you know we certainly want to um, address what you need us to do this evening so it would be helpful for me if we could just quantify that i know we have that in the questions but i think uh perhaps a little uh expanded clarification would be helpful eric uh sure i mean i think the the bare minimum that staff would need would be just confirmation that we're going in the right direction we had a lot of recommendations in the staff report uh, including uh, proposed changes to uses. We also had some diagrams that we're gonna be working off of and some additional design guidance and standards that we're gonna continue to develop. So, um, you know, confirmation that we're going in the right direction uh, or disagreement, you know, no, don't go in this direction, go in a different direction. Um, I think in looking at any of the additional materials that we provided, if there's anything else that you want us to focus on, I think that would be bonus. So if, um, you know, the commission, you know, as, as a group says, um, yeah, you know, these things uh, all look pretty good, but we really, really want to make sure that you focus on, you know, these particular architectural styles or these particular features on buildings or, um, you know, ensuring that office buildings are, um, you know, have their massing that kind of respects the scale and character of downtown and really focus on that. So, so any kind of direction um, that you want us to focus on would be great as well. Thanks. That's helpful. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Commissioner Ian. Uh, yes. I was just curious if anyone could tell me Pre-COVID, I know COVID threw everyone for a loop in the retail district. Um, Pre-COVID, the long-term owners who were not motivated to even uh, rent out some of the storefronts, how many are we talking about? How many of those vacant storefronts pre-COVID are due to sort of um, a lack of incentive versus, you know, no one wants to rent the place? Uh, I'm only aware of a couple, um, you know, I think the, uh, there's the China Delight, which, you know, I, I, I don't know the story there, <laughs> honestly, you know, it's been vacant for, I don't know, years, years or more, um, and clearly the property owner has no interest in, in renting it out. Um, I mean, it would be a viable site for any number of different uses, but it, and it's a, you know, it's a fairly large building, fairly large site. But, um, you know, the other example that I think comes up a lot is the corner of Villa and Bryant, where the there was supposed to be a coffee shop there that was never rented out. Um, you know, and that's kind of a well-known uh, 
example because it, it's been brought up a lot by the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the story there was supposedly that the, the property owner had no incentive to rent it out because the, the offices preferred that it not be a public facing use. Um, the, um, uh, I'm not aware of any others. I am aware of, uh, you know, other property properties that have been, that have had long-term vacancies, but where we were in conversation with the property owner about them saying, you know, what about this tenant? Could that work? What about this tenant? Could that work? So, um, you know, I'm not aware of any other sites where the property owner just didn't care and wasn't interested in renting it out. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, rumors abound. So, you know, I had just heard from some people that there was actually one landlord who owned multiple buildings and fell into that category. And so I just wasn't sure if there actually was a survey done or attempts were made to locate owners and say, hey, your place has been vacant for years. Is there anything you want to do about it? Or can we help you to do something about it? Um, I just fear that a lot of people are under the impression that it is not possible to rent out space when sometimes it is not due to um, the market. Um, in fact, in the ULI report, it said that the broker didn't even, a lot of the workers didn't even know that Mountain View had vacancies and that there was this story to tell and they're like, please hire someone so that we can, we can find out about this. I think they were excited um, to learn about it. So yeah, I just want to get a clear picture of why we have what we have, what the reasons are, and then it's easier to make you know recommendations based on that. Um, unless, uh, well, we want to get toward the end of questions and move on to the to the discussion. So, Vice Chair Lowe, additional question or Commissioner Dempsey sir, hasn't uh, had a chance to ask any questions. Why don't we uh, go to him first, and then we'll come back to you, Vice Chair Lowe. I'm easy. I just want to second what Commissioner Yin just said. I think that that's actually really smart. I would be very interested to know what some of the barriers are um, to getting some of those vacant storefronts filled. If there's any kind of proper role for the city in, in helping that along, because that's, I think, the best way to activate downtown is fill some of those empty slots. Okay. Uh, very Thank you. Um, I have gotten some um, community feedback for um, the downtown area um, lacking safe bike storage or bike valet. Uh, people want to be able to bike to downtown, but they feel like they don't have a safe place to store their bike while they shop. Or um, So I'm wondering if that's something that's in our scope to bring up and discuss tonight, or is that for a later phase? Uh, so public bike parking, uh, we will probably be discussing as part of the downtown parking strategy uh, with city council, um, probably in a later, you know, not uh, this upcoming meeting, but but in a later meeting, it will be one of the tools that we will be looking at. Um, if you're talking about private bike parking, um, I assume you're talking about public bike parking because it's um, you know, valet for anybody coming in. Um, yeah, the only other thing that I know of is the uh, the shelter over there at, at the transit center, which um, you know, if you contact city hall, you can you can get a key to it and and have access to that shelter. Um, and there may be changes to that from the transit center master plan, but I'm not aware of any. All right, then let's move on to the questions that staff has brought forward. Um, first item was does the EPC support the historic preservation staff recommended to rely on existing preservation incentives and authority under CEQA and the city code? Would like to go first. Commissioner Hillmeyer. I'll start us off. I, I support the staff recommendation. I think our explanations tonight were very helpful and, and there's still adequate preservation measures available albeit on a site-by-site -site basis, but I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation and we'll support it. Commissioner Schmeisen? I also support the staff recommendation. It's heartening to hear how much thought has gone into 
potential backup measures in lieu of designating downtown Mountain View as a historical district. I think um, I, I hear the, the amount of concern from my fellow residents of Mountain View. And so I think hopefully if we are vigilant and continue to monitor the safety nets in place and update as needed, it sounds like the downtown precise plan would allow for those updates. So I will also support the staff recommendation. Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Cabillas. And I, I will also support the um, staff direction because I think uh, it, with our questions, I think you realize that we still have some gaps. I think when you are um, dependent on the national and the state standards that are passed down, uh, we kind of recognize that we need to be a little bit more vigilant locally about how we address kind of individual sites and how we want to, um, you know, preserve that look and feel. I think that is, you know, come across with the public comments that people are very concerned about that uh, look and feel and to maintain the, the, you know, the few historical sites from our perspective that we want to make sure that are are considered and that that stay in place but i think for the moment i think at this particular point where we are i think we're we're moving in the right direction thank you for all your work this one is tough uh commissioner Ian? Yeah, I just, um, you know, I have concerns and I'll, I'll just state them as quickly as I can. And this is um, going on a little bit longer than maybe many expected. Um, so I, I, I guess one question is, does, do city leaders, does the community, does the businesses feel that having a historic downtown is an asset? And it seems to me through what the workshops with the stakeholders have said through what um, community members have said through even what some of us have said and um, even the report uh, that was put together by ULI had said that it's actually a huge strength probably the, the predominant strength so if that's the case then it goes to the what what is the difference between having a district or not and what I've heard tonight is that um, we have incentives in place for upkeep. We have tax breaks. We have a whole list that you guys put together. Thank you very much for all that work. It, it looks like a significant list, but then I'm also hearing that it's very hard to attain those incentives or to, to get them. Um, and if those were already in place and still no upkeep, then what is the difference then? What is going to get a lot of the owners to be able to afford to make the improvements? Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit worried that if we're relying on development standards, development standards, I think, are are going to help tremendously to maintain sort of a historic look and feel of the historic area. But it is not the same as having the historic buildings in place. Now, it doesn't mean if you're historic, you can't change. In fact, I think most historian, most uh, architectural historians prefer that the buildings adapt so that they can be actively used. And it doesn't mean that it has to be a museum. In fact, they argue strongly against it. Um, the, but if we don't actually preserve the buildings that have been there and have historic value, and we're just going to sort of mimic a historic district, that is exactly what the Urban Land Institute said. It's going against the recommendation. They're telling us what is a strength, is the actual historic buildings, the organic nature of how it feels, the small scale storefronts, done over time and that many many cities throughout the country have tried to mimic it and cannot do it 
And what we have is a gem because it's literally historic. Different styles over different periods when they were popular. So I guess my concern is if we don't protect the, the genuineness of our historic district, then we're left with mimicking. And mimicking has already proven to not work. So that's my concern. And then, you know, what, you know, if, you're, if business owners are not incentivized to make changes, given all the benefits that are listed, what is preventing them from just getting together with their neighbor and saying, hey, let's sell? Let's just build a new one and then use the development. The development would say, let's just use the standards to recreate a historic look. We have three blocks that could go very quickly. I mean, the Wells Fargo building, the new church building, and that, that's like a, almost half a block long. Anyways, my concerns, putting it out there. If I, if I could just say, um, just momentarily, what you pointed out, the Wells Fargo building and the church building, and you said they're almost a block long, is exactly why I would suggest that the area H um, won't see that type of development because those parcels are all 25 feet or 50 feet long. And they're all owned by individual people who have owned them for an incredibly long time. And so what you generally find in those patterns is you don't find major aggregation. What you, so, so, so the, it's actually the area fronting Castro Street is the area I'm almost least concerned with from a professional standpoint of seeing things change over time. Um, the, any sites that have an inkling of interest in, of redevelopment are generally sites that are larger sites that are on the corners that uh, don't have important buildings on them that are going to raise the ire of the public if they were going to be considered to be removed. And so, um, and, and in talking with the general interest level of the development community, those are sort of the properties that are considered as potential for future development. And then you have other regulations in place right now policies such as uh, needing to park those projects on site that really is keeping those developments from occurring. And you haven't really seen a lot of development on small sites because they can't park the upper floor uses on sites. They, they aren't able to even take advantage of the floor area ratio that they currently have on the property under the zoning because you can't park them. So I think that there are mechanisms in place that are restricting the development potential. And I, I, I'm, I'm hearing a huge concern over Castro Street changing dramatically and I actually, have, having looked at it for the last 20 years now, I, I'm not seeing it as being a huge sensitive area, it's sensitive in the sense that it's being threatened for change. I, I'm just not, I, I haven't seen it uh, and I'm not seeing it. Um, so uh, I think that with a little bit of diligence and some regulatory tweaking of the regulations and some stronger design standards, I think that that will go a long way to achieving your goals of maintaining the character of the area. Um, okay, um, thank you. I, I do appreciate what you're saying and I am hearing you. I'm just gonna play devil's advocate a little bit, if you don't mind, Mr. Williams. Um, I know you've been doing this a long time, 20 years is definitely a long time. Um, but some of these buildings were built before 1900. So um, things do change, time does track on, and a lot of these owners are long-term owners. And if we're looking from a broad standpoint, just as I see a lot of my neighbors, when they pass, then their children are tasked with making decisions. 
and not a lot of the kids always agree. And very often the house ends up, ends up being sold. Things end up selling. Um, so what happens then? And again, when you say you don't see a whole lot of, you know, potential for that, as I mentioned earlier, the last one was Tide House and the Wallhammer House. That was a, as a big one and they were going to aggregate and put up a big office building. So I'm, my concerns, I feel like are, they, they remain. I understand. Right. Um, Commissioner Dempsey. So, um, so for me, I'll be supporting the, the staff reco because I agree with the outcome, but I did want to say one thing and that's in an ideal world, I would have liked it if we could have just continued this item for two weeks in order for the, um, for a couple of reasons, really it's sort of in the spirit of transparency and good process. And I noticed that some of our friends in the community were concerned about not understanding exactly how we did our math and the staff report. Um, and I think we've gotten a lot more clarity now, but I just, I think I just wish that in an ideal world, we could, we could wait just a tiny bit longer, revise the staff report. So it's clear for, you know, for all and sundry into the future, exactly how we came to the decision we did. Um, because process is important and transparency is important. Having said that, I still agree with the outcome, so I'll be supporting it today, but I just wanted to make a plug for transparency. Ms. Chilo. Thank you. Um, I do share some of the concerns that the public has raised, um, especially speakers from Livable Mountain View, uh, and of course, uh, Commissioner Yin. Um, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on what Eric had said earlier, which is uh, regarding the local designation. Um, right now, there's no rule to implement it, and it's in the name only. Um, and it needs to be in the city code in order for it to be really have some teeth behind it. So I just wanted to um, understand a bit more whether that is something that we should look at doing to add it to the the ordinance the city code um we are certainly uh have it on our kind of long-term work plan to do an update to our historic ordinance which which could include that i mean we haven't gotten into the detail yet of, of everything that it, our historic ordinance could include uh, but it is certainly in our long-term work plan um, and, um, you know, Council's in the middle of the um, strategic roadmap process and, you know, is, is kind of making that call about how to prioritize projects like that. Yeah, if I remember correctly, that this one did not make it into the, did it make it into the list or not? Um, I don't think it's on the latest list, but um, I'm not 100% sure, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think we, I would love to see that, as you said, as a the long term direction that we move towards so that um, the protection can be stronger than just in the design guidelines. Commissioner Yen, you have your hand back up? Yes, yeah, quickly. Um, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, um, was just if everybody kind of values the historic aspect of it, then is there something we can do? Um, different tax incentives. Uh, someone had mentioned some sort of fund for the businesses so that they can be helped, you know, incentivize like facade improvements. Or is there a consultant that can be hired out of those funds to expedite some of these tax benefits that are so difficult to transfer. I'm just trying to find solutions. Um, so these are things I'm hoping can be part of the discussion and kind of zipped up to, to council to, to think about um, and for 
staff, I know you guys have worked very hard on this, but if there if there's anything else that can be done, um, you know, aside from saying it's just really hard, they're not going to do anything. Um, we can only enforce new buildings and have them kind of make it look like it's historic. I'm not trying to downplay that. That is important and, and I value it. But um, back to my, my concern about the actual historic buildings, I, I just wonder what else can be done to find solutions for the business owners to, you know, really partake in, you know, take pride in their historic building, in the fact that it's the heart of the city, that so many people in the city really enjoy the charm and character um, and, you know, it's it's the number one strength of our downtown. It's three little blocks, and it'd be nice if we could, you know, do what we can to, to, help, to help out. Commissioner uh, Capillas? Based on those comments, I think it would be uh, good to kind of add that into our uh, recommendations and to council that, that we do have those more local details from a historical perspective um, just in court um, incorporated into our ordinance because uh, we don't have one but it seems like from our discussions that there's definitely a desire to make sure that that we do cover that topic so I just would like to um, see what the rest of the commissioners think I like the direction we're going in, but I think in addition to we need we need those particular issues and concerns that have been addressed incorporated into um, you know possible ordinance that would cover that beyond the uh, building designs. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, if the, if an owner does not. Um, uh, want to upgrade or update their historic building, is there any consequence? So, you know, that's another question that, that I have. That It's wonderful to give them all incentives, but if there's no consequence, if they don't respond, is there anything legally that the city can do? Um, you know, that's another question I have. Thank you. Um, I mean, when things get literally unsafe, there are certainly nuisance and uh, code enforcement actions that the city can take. Um, beyond that, uh, no, there's there's no um, you know enforcement standard that we can take where it's you know something needs a, a little bit of TLC. Um, we don't we don't have any enforcement that I know of. Um, I don't know if Sandy, you are you looking? No, I mean I, I agree with what you just said, Eric. There isn't anything additional unless it's really deteriorated to um, that type of standard where it's unsafe or blighted. If we had blight provisions. Commissioner um, Schmidt. Uh, just to follow up on some of the things that my fellow commissioners are bringing up, I really do like the idea of looking at, in addition to what carrots already exist for maintaining uh, exteriors, maintaining these buildings, um, if there's any other carrots. I think that Com uh, Vice Chair Lowe brings up a really good point, and Commissioner Yun as well, looking at, right, long term, what is the big picture? Um, and I know that we just went through and gave our list of recommendations, but and I, I didn't really think about a his, the historical preserve ordinance. Um, I wasn't really sure what that meant. I think looking at, looking at that list, but hearing this discussion and how passionate people are, I think that could be something interesting to look into. I was going to um, bring up this comment under question two. I guess my one concern with either penalizing or um, I guess the, the number of requirements for businesses is like one of the public comments that we got. There is a lot of vacancy in downtown Mountain View. I will not pretend to be an expert on the nature of these vacancies, you know, what types of businesses are not able to come. Um, but it's something I notice every time I go downtown. And I guess my one concern with too many 
stringent requirements or penalizations, it might make it harder for business owners. Um, I don't know what profits are looking like, especially during COVID, but to have that extra wiggle room to make these uh, modifications or um, design design modifications. I was going to bring up that point with question two, but I'll I'll bring it up now. <laughs> um, well, let me. I'll, uh, my comment. I'm a. Uh, so in general, um, what SAS has proposed, I'm supportive of. Um, in the questions that I provided to staff ahead of time, I asked the question about some of the things that Hercules had done in their precise plan, and staff mentioned that council specifically didn't want to do um, form-based zoning, and that's that's not actually what I was getting to. In the examples in Hercules, they actually looked at, here's the accountability design from this time period, and standards were kind of based around that, and I, the in the exhibit eight of the, of the staff report, um, it showed some of these things of what you might do in design and, and standards. But one of the examples given was the Fenwick and, Best, Fenwick and West building, and I don't view that as a historical building at all, okay? So the ones where you were showing examples of how you might define um, the standards uh, on on what can be what can be done and, and go for it, go forward. I would prefer that those standards be based on the buildings were from the 1800s and the buildings from the early 1900s, rather than the one that's based on something that was built t 10 years ago. Um, that doesn't mean that the style of a Fenwick and Best building that couldn't meet those criteria, but it just it struck me as not being. If, if we're trying to have a character that's consistent with those historic buildings. Basing one of them on the Fenwick and West building seems like that's not as inconsistent with what we we're trying to do. Okay, so I like the idea of the standards. I just, let's just try to keep those focused on that historic feel that we have downtown, rather than than something that's that's purely contemporary. Doesn't mean the contemporary can't work. Um, and then I'm a I'm a believer in both carrot and stick. Um, I'm a homeowner, some of us also are homeowners, and if you do a little bit of repairs now and then, your house lasts much longer and you don't have to do those major overhauls. So I would be very, I would really like to recommend to council that we look at something like what Mr. Williams talked about, which is a smaller scale program that makes it easy, it has a, a small amount of funds for businesses to do touch-ups. They can do, they can repaint their building, they can do if they've got one one window that needs to be repaired, maybe it falls into that. If it gets to the point where they have to do a quarter million or three hundred thousand dollar overhaul, if something's been going on wrong for a long time, and something in place that has a is it a percentage of, of downtown sales taxes or whatever that encourages them to come back and say, "Hey, I'll give you a forgivable loan. You go ahead and put in twenty thousand dollars in improvements, and now your building lasts for another five years." That's a good thing. So I like the carrot. Um, certainly some of the vacancies right now are a result of COVID. You know, business is just struggling, and I can test to that. Um, but San Francisco did put in place a, a program that says, if you leave your building vacant for a certain period of time, I'm going to fine you, okay? If you're not making any effort to lease your space, that, that actually creates then the stick that says, if you just sit there and do nothing with your building, that's not cool either. Do both. It says um, I don't. I don't think the city has the money to do quarter million dollar upgrades to every building in downtown. But if we made it easier for them to do small upgrades here and there, that's a good thing. And also, um, whack them on the head if they're sitting or doing nothing and not trying again, not letting the real estate agents in the area know that hey, my space is for rent. Come come to Mountain View. Um, then maybe that would encourage them to go look at it further. So those are my comments. And I think it's generally in the right track, but I think there's some, those things that I would advocate that we, that we pass on to council. So Commissioner Ian. Uh, yeah, I also believe in the carrot and the stick. I believe in a nice juicy carrot to the extent possible that is not unreasonable and using the stick sparingly. But when it comes to vacancies, that 
gives the perception, regardless of the reason, it gives the perception that businesses are not doing well. It makes it harder for the neighbors to rent. It makes it harder for the neighbors to draw business with COVID. I think things will improve in, in, in time past COVID. So hopefully just in time for many of the business owners. Um, but I do think long-term vacancies are really um, something we need to address. Thanks. I have another um, suggestion, which is um, to help make these older buildings more sustainable so that they can save energy and the buildings can be used for a much longer time to bring them, you know, more up to date. Whether there's any um, sustainability grant out there that they can tap into or the city can help them apply to. I, I don't know the answer, but I just wanted to put that idea out there. Especially with, you know, some of the federal money that's um, being given to cities and whatnot. I don't know if Eric or Rick know anything about that. Uh, I'll just say that um, you know PG&E has some upgrade efforts, et cetera, that are generally ongoing. Um, there, there aren't a lot of sustainability grants out uh, out there right now for, um, for for kind of minor improvements. They're more oriented to larger scale projects, but. Um, but we will take a look at it and, uh, and and bring those back if we find any. Thank you. All right. Um, we ready to move on to question two? Um, right, Commissioner Ian. Yeah, one last thing. Um, I believe the city hired a new economic or vitality manager, Mr. Lang. And I don't know when he was hired or how long he's been working, but did he have any input on this since he's dealing with the, the businesses? And I would, I would think that perhaps he would have some ideas um, and, and hope that we get his input into how we can juice up the carrot or, you know, under what conditions can the stick come out? Uh, well, you know, if, if, he has started. It's been days. Um, okay. No, no. Um, uh, we do. We have always had an economic development division. We have Tiffany Chu, our, our business development specialist, who's outstanding. Um, Edgar, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about how she's been involved so far. Yeah. So uh, you know, I have shared the report with her and highlighted. You know, if if we to look at possibly uh, any incentives of the likes um, as we've been hearing today. Um, and, and Tiffany uh, highlighted that the, the deal with that is going to be uh, finding uh, funds. Um, and obviously those funds will have to come uh, from somewhere and um, likely the city. Um, and two, uh, it, it would require uh, staff time uh, to, to look into possible funding if there is any available. Uh, so ultimately, um, you know, there's been very brief thought into it, um, but if it is something that uh, the uh, commission uh, desires, then that is something we could uh, further analyze. Hey, thanks. Okay. Um, so question two. Does the PC support the development character and design staff recommendations to update areas A, G, and H standards and our guidelines, including objective standards such as FIR, clarify the design expectations of area H? Um, Commissioner Yen, are you chiming in? Is it? Sorry, that's a leftover hand, but I'll chime in later. Go ahead. Anyone? Commissioner Hammer. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, um, Sean. I, I, I really like the emphasis on compatibility. I mean, I think 
the challenges that we, we want to send a signal of what we're looking for and have uniform standards um, and guidelines to that point. So I, I think the emphasis is, is spot on. Um, I, I hear and echo other concerns about, you know, parcel consolidation and what that could mean. But I think because these are relatively small parcels and the focus and the way that the language has been written is really about looking at compatibility to the existing form. Um, I know from working with other cities, right, it, objective standards are sometimes misused. And I think the ones that are proposed here um, really are, are measurable and easily, you know, you can, they can be uniformly applied. And so um, I think staff did a really nice job with, with spelling this piece up. Good. Other commissioners? Commissioner Ian. Oh, yeah, I am all for clarity of intent and great diagrams. Um, having worked on some diagrams, I know it is extraordinarily difficult to, to come up with diagrams that give the intent in a clear way. Um, very often, developers might look at the diagram and say, well, that's what I'm building, when it's really supposed to be sort of this plastic form. Um, so I would be all for ensuring that those diagrams are done super well um I, I would i did want to bring up something which is in addition to the design guidelines becoming development standards and having the diagrams i know we're in the beginning so i'm not expecting like the diagrams right now um could we also add storefront or a range of storefront widths as something we want to look at because if you look even at the map of all the different parcels we'll see those last three blocks which everyone says are super active and they love as mr williams mentioned they're tiny parcels and they're narrow on castro south of california they become much wider and if you just stand out there one day on a saturday and stand on a block where there are parcels and one where they have super wide storefronts, like the Wells Fargo. Almost half the block is one storefront. The other half is Kaiser, I believe, and its medical center. So it's like two or three, four, I think it's four, I counted, four sort of stores on one block, and it's a bigger block. Then you look at a block in the one to 300 block, and you can get oh, I want to say like 12 shops in a smaller block. And that's what activates historic portion. Now, I don't know if this is something that is covered in development standards or if it has to go somewhere else, but it seems to me characteristic of what makes the first three blocks under, the, sorry, south of the train station active versus a block that isn't, and literally, I just challenge anyone to stand on those blocks and just count the number of people coming and going, coming and going. And you'll see that even with the Park Place apartments where the Starbucks is and so on and so forth, you get so much more activity versus any that have like tiny shop fronts. And that is also one of the strengths that was listed in the ULI report. And it is in your current uh, downtown precise plan, and it'll, we're anticipating bolstering those standards. So the, the storefront widths and lengths, is there a, a maximum or a minimum, is like a range? Yeah, there's a, there's a recommendation of approximately 25 feet currently. Okay, so if there is parcel aggregation and a building comes in and ends up taking up two parcels and it's 50 feet wide, they will have to rent out to two different shop owners and have two different shop fronts. Is that correct? They, they currently, uh, they have, the way the standard is currently written and we'll be refining it, is, is that you have to have, if you had a building that was combined, it would be moduled in 25 feet. It doesn't absolutely have to be two different shops, but there is another standard that kicks in when it's the larger space that uh, that they ask 
it's in the standards currently that you they ask that you have smaller shops in front of a larger space that's kind of behind it. So there's a number of, of diagrams in the precise plan currently that we're going to be refining. And we're also discussing addressing the side streets and how much of that we want to do in a similar manner. Okay, that's great to know. Thanks, Mr. Williams. Commissioner uh, Schmeising. Yeah, I agree with staff's recommendation. Um, a couple of things that I really liked were was the consideration of accessibility from the sidewalks, and I think as has come up multiple towns, how pedestrian friendly our downtown is, and that's something I've always appreciated. I did also like the point about considering incorporation of green um, green spaces into that store frontage, and I know that that was something that uh, the Mountain View Coalition for Sustainable Development brought up in their letter was thinking about uh, just that green architecture, bringing, bringing more of that in. And so I liked that that was included in this. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, my, and you know, I'm certainly not an expert. I think my only hesitation or, or concern is just right, balancing that the amount of vacancy we have downtown with what are we requiring of businesses and of course not not just saying hey whatever you want um <laughs> in terms of design but and i you know much smarter people than me have considered this um so that's you know just from my point of view uh staff taking into consideration um that moving forward thank you uh vice chair Lowe. thank you um, to echo something that um, Commissioner Schmising said and also the comments brought up by Green Space uh, MB and um, Sustain Coalition for Sustainability Planning. Um, I noticed the open space language in the precise plan. It's pretty out of date. Um, so I wonder, uh, staff has done an excellent job in um, crafting some of that language in the newer precise plans, such as the East Westman and North Bay Shore. And I suggest some of those um, landscaping, you know, standards and design principles be incorporated into the downtown precise plan to bring it more up to date. Uh, like I said, under the open space sections, uh, in particular, um, I think we, we should stress the benefits of green spaces to not only human health, but biodiversity, sustainability, etc. cetera. Um, for example, maybe some of the objective standards that we can include can be a uh, percentage of tree canopy coverage. Uh, it can be percentage of native plants that have to be utilized uh, when species are you know, being considered. Um, that's very important for biodiversity consideration. So those are some of the ideas that I would like to suggest to, to staff, but in general, I do agree um, with what you're recommending. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dempsey, Commissioner Phillips. I generally really like the direction this is going, and just so I can say, I added something. Um, in a different town, I recently saw a, a living arbor. It was like this awning that came down o over the top, but it was all vines. It was all plants that created the arbor, and I just thought it was absolutely beautiful and just wonderful. So if there's a way to work that in there, too, I'd love it. Commissioner Capos? And I, I definitely like the direction that uh, we're going, and I think the added value of the, the greenery and the uh, pedestrian access and all of that, and even though that's not really <clears throat> in our purview, I think we want to emphasize the importance of that and the usage of, um, you know, the, the uh, the greenery and the biodiversity and just to 
kind of have that, you know, very much at the forefront of our mind to make sure that uh, that gets updated and incorporated too. Um, Commissioner Williams back. Oh, we can let, oh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll jump on that bandwagon. I'm a big proponent of the, the greening of spaces. Um, and then one other comment on the, the diagrams really quickly is that I, I think it might be even simpler. I don't know what direction we're going with the diagrams yet, so forgive me if you're already doing this. Instead of having the multiple styles and then repeating a lot of the development standards for each, is to just get the generic development standards in one diagram and then if there were to be different styles, just asterisk it out and just give the characteristics of those like windows uh, for different styles. And that way it's actually quite simple. It's less verbiage and just one clear diagram. And again, I know how difficult it is to do diagrams. Um, it's one of the things that the easier it is, the more time was spent on doing it. Um, so I appreciate the work that's gone into it, but um, I think that might help a lot. And then, then uh, I also agree with the, the general approach. I, uh, I strongly support Commissioner Yin's concern and, and encourage staff to look at the, how do you break, break apart um, anything that could potentially get aggregated. I, I'm the one that asked the question about the Wells Fargo space because it just didn't feel like, didn't feel like a property that I would want something that big and that long down in that, those first three blocks. And so uh, really uh, would like to, make sure that if that's in there that's great if we can strengthen it more that's great um, on the green space I realize it's not part of this scope but I would be strongly I, I would agree that and when we look at phase two uh, of the project bringing that kind of thing in the streetscapes and that kind of thing in uh, would be something I would wholly support as well. uh, Commissioner Yen did you have another comment or is that over hand sorry left over hand Okay. All right. Um, then let's go to question number three, which was, does the EP support the active ground floor usage staff recommendation prohibit, to prohibit administrative offices from NIH? Who wants to start us out? Anybody? Okay. Well, I can talk. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm in favor of, of restricting in those areas. Uh, if I have a question at all, it's it's to some extent tied to Commissioner Haymeyer's comments earlier um, at the beginning on what's coming when. I don't have a good sense for what's um, what the plans are in the transit center and. Right now, the, the if you um, the, the the little map shows the restriction on administrative offices on the the block along um, Evelyn from Castro to Hope, um, but it doesn't show the same restriction on the next block up. And if the intention of the transit center is it's something bigger and there's a lot of different activity off the transit center. I guess it, it raised a question in my mind whether that red line should continue one block further down um, into um, area G along the frontage there. Um, again, I don't have, we're, we're, I do feel, you know, with the, with the potential change to the pedestrian mall, the, the transit center, the parking, we are missing a lot of pieces that would help make this feel like it should connect all together, but I just, if the transit center is a bigger open area with a lot of activity than having um, having it more retail focused along that all that frontage by the transit center would seem to make more sense to me than only just ha than only half of it. Um, but that's you know, that, that's my only the only question that I would have is whether that whether that would be potentially feasible as well. Okay, other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Dempsey. 
Thank you. Um, so I've actually been struggling this one with this one for a couple of days, and it's a I feel like I'm in a weird position because I actually think ultimately phasing out administrative offices in that area is a good idea. But where I get stuck is, well, a couple of places. I think, Chair Cranston, you mentioned sort of the missing pieces of the puzzle. There's a lot of things changing in that space. I kind of wish we could get them all kind of orchestrated a little better. And, and as we've already discussed a lot today, the, the vacancy piece, and that, that weighs heavily on me. Like if we have a lot of spaces that are open, it seems out of timing to further restrict what you could put in them. Um, and, and maybe even going a step farther, it seems like a, a doesn't seem like a positive message to send to the to the folks that own that property, who may be struggling because of COVID or, or the death of retail or many other reasons to fill that slot. Um, and it, it just doesn't feel kind to to send the message of well we're going to take some more things away that you can't put there. If the vacancy rate was lower, I think I'd probably feel differently. I think if we could even do this at the same time we're deciding that we're going to have a pedestrian mall, which I love. I really hope we do that. I wish we, we could fill it with parklets. Um, I'm really excited about that potentiality. And I think that that, if, we, if there was a way that we could really just solidify that that's what we're going to do with that space, it would be easier for me to justify it. But I think without that certainty, because of the vacancy rates, I couldn't quite get myself over the line. So I'm, I'm going to be probably staying off this one today. Uh, Commissioner Yin? Um, yes, I, I'm in favor of um, removing the administrative offices. Um, I think someone from the public had mentioned limiting the personal service offices. Um, I'm all for offering more flexibility. I think they, they add value to a downtown, um, but I do think it should be limited. And I also struggle with timing and not having all the pieces, you know, again, COVID threw a big wrench into things and all the recommendations that were made by the consultant, I don't think even got a chance to get implemented. So I, I don't know how that would follow through. And then again, without knowing why certain places are vacant, if it's due to the fact that they can't rent, that brokers didn't know, so on and so forth, I would hate to, you know, say, you know, anything is possible now, because once they're in, it's very hard to remove. Um, as we know, the current administrative offices are going to have to be phased over time, which is fair. Um, so I, I almost wish we had a little bit of time before we implemented the limitation on percent and number of personal service type offices, but I'm all in favor of administrative offices not being on the ground floor of the downtown because it just is not active at all. It's not for the public. It is purely for the office. Thanks. Commissioner uh, Hamler? Sure. I, I guess. I want to make the point that I, I mean, I worked at the chamber 20 years ago and retail has struggled in Mountain View for a long time. This is not unique to COVID. Um, the rents are high. It's, there aren't enough people to support the kind of small shops that we all love. And I, I, I struggle if we don't have some kind of alternative policy or tiering to say we're going to ban this use entirely. I, I get the sentiment, but if, unless we're talking about something like what Chair Clarkson said, where if you have a vacancy for a certain number or some duration of time, it, it just seems a little too extreme to maybe not have some tiers and say, like, you know, if, if a place is going to be vacant for X period of time, you know, that it could be considered. I mean, one of the challenges I've seen, right, and we know this to be true, right, you think of the old book sink location, right, they, they raised the rents too much, uh, the bookstore moved down the street, and it has been vacant for three years, four years at this point, and so it, ground floor activation only works if there's some kind of activation, right, I'd rather have an office employee being able to walk to and from there, the transit center into town and maybe go to lunch at a restaurant nearby or maybe support that kind of and, and you know buy their groceries to and from like I, 
I, I just think there needs to be some kind of, of tiering that would allow for flexibility because retail is really hard in downtown Mountain View and it's not going to get easier even if we have a phenomenal recovery from COVID. The rents are exorbitant. It, there's just there are too many issues. I talk, I am downtown every single day and I can tell you the number of self as centers who I talk to who say, I, I've had to let my employees go. I can't, I can't afford to do this. I can't afford to do that. Like that's not going to get better. And so I just, I really struggle by taking away one option. I know that we don't want large scale office in, in the historic character and I, I see those impacts, but it seems like we're limiting a tool if we don't have different criteria that say, after a certain period of time, if you're not able to fill this vacancy, we would consider under as a provisional use um, in the space. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Capos. I, I really um, agree with the comments from Commissioner Haymeyer because I think we see, um, you know, those businesses struggling and perhaps, you know, the tiering would be more a, um, you know, a provisional time to, to get some activity into the area. So I think we need to give that a little bit more thought just to say, instead of just kind of a blanket statement, no administrative offices, what we may want to do is to look at uh, the possibilities. I mean, we need to hear from, you know, the owners. What are they looking at? What are they trying to put in there? And to at least incorporate some kind of flexibility like that, because otherwise um, you're just kind of, you know, it's kind of like a hard stop if that is the only only option they have for a, a certain uh, limited amount of time, I think we need to be open to listen to that. So I, I think that's, a, you know, a good uh, recommendation and a thought that we should forward to the council so they, they can help us kind of look at, you know, what, it, what is really fair to both sides. I mean, we want to see that retail in this area, but what that looks like, we've got to look at the business owners and the opportunities that they have to rent their space and to whom. And maybe maybe they come up with something very creative that, you know, we don't see right now. So I think to leave it open and to leave it more flexible would be the way I'd like to see us approach it. Uh, I would second what both Commissioner Humeyer and Commissioner Caprillis said. Um, I don't see it as like a green light, no questions asked um, type of use, uh, maybe yellow light, so that there can be that flexibility, but also thoughtful consideration of what exactly is being proposed and um, what, are, what are the circumstances within this proposal is occurring. Um, so I think, yeah, a tiering system just continued dialogue and thought on this would be my personal recommendation. Vice Chair Lowe. Thank you. Um, I actually was going to propose something um, somewhat different, but I think I wanted to achieve kind of the same goal, which is in an ideal world, I would love to see the downtown to attract you know, very diverse types of uh, businesses um, so that it's more rounded, uh, more well-rounded. Well um, and I wonder if there's a way for us to, for the city to prioritize the different types of businesses that we want in different zones. Um, so for example, for this zone, these three are the most desired types of uh, businesses. And these three are kind of tier two, you know, medium desire, followed by, you know, we will allow these if you have tried really hard and cannot find the most desire, medium desire. Um, so, yeah, so not, a, you know, we do not allow this, but kind of go through the process of trying to uh, attract the most, uh, the, the type of business that we want the most. 
Um, I would love to see more creative spaces, you know, more cultural and art um, type of uh, businesses, youth development, types of things that will, you know, um, enhance community building, more health and wellness type of um, stores and businesses, and also um, pop-ups or other more creative ways of using uh, smaller spaces. Maybe it can be shared by a couple of smaller uh, mom and pop shops. Um, yeah, so those are some of my thoughts. Thanks. Commissioner Yes, um, I, I agree that, you know, we should get creative with how we do things um, to attract um, as many of what is ideal. I know that the ideal is very hard to attain. Um, I still maintain that administrative offices uh, should, should not be allowed in the areas. And remember, I'm talking about the ground floor. And the reason why the ground floor is so important is because this is the heart of the city. It is the downtown because it's Main Street. When people go, again, you know exactly where they go, and I can go through why that is. If you stand on the block, if you go to page seven of exhibit four, and it shows the ground floor uses back in, I think it was 2019, blue is office. And if you stand on those blocks, I want you to think about how often you go to those blocks to do anything and how often you go to downtown for a restaurant instead or something else. Um, and if you imagine that block just extended through our historic area H, we don't have a main street anymore. We don't actually have a downtown, we have an office park. And we, we can tear, I, I, I can understand the tearing method and, and why, um, but again, I, I like to learn from past experiences and Villa and Bryant was brought up where the owner and the developer said we could not find someone to rent out the space and found out later multiple shop owners and cafe owners said we would love to be in there no one reached out to us and it was because that the owner preferred security guard in an empty space versus actually renting it out so if we allow for the administrative office i think that's what we're going to get and then we will lose our the vitality of our downtown and again once it's in it's very hard to to remove so i say let us give us a chance let's look at timing and how things play out i do feel for the small businesses that are hurting but i think if we can get creative and look at what can be done to help them through incentives, tax breaks, hiring consultants, expediters, whatever it is, I would rather do that than allow for uses that will kill our downtown. So I'll uh, jump back in here. Um, the first location that the business that I'm that I currently own was in was a small, narrow building in San Francisco owned by a long-term owner. They raised the proposed rent by almost 15% and opted to have us move out. They left the space vacant for two full years until they finally rented it out again at less than less than what I would what what I would have been paying beforehand because they believed that they could charge retail rents well above what was going on in the area around it. So Mr. Dempsey, Mr. Hermeyer, I understand this idea that you need to give them some time, but I am I am less confident of the goodwill of landlords to be out there trying to make sure that they're bringing in the kind of what we want in downtown and skeptical of, of that timing. So if we look at something like that, we've got to be, we've got to be very sure that we understand how we prevent gamesmanship on these kind of things, because that's what will happen. I, when we say categorically that not every landlord is like that in any way, shape or form, but there are some out there that will say, you know what, I, I want a different tenant or I want to, I want to, I want to skim and they're going to put the rents so high that they never even get, they never take 
no tenant has ever seriously looked at. So I'm this, I'm uh, I'm very skeptical of time-based things that say, okay, if you keep it vacant for this amount of time, then you're okay going administrative, because that may be a game that they say, okay, cool, I'm going to play that game. And we end up with administrative offices all over the place. So if we head down that path, that would be my caution to council, is that this is not just you know, a straight time-based thing is is going is not necessarily going to give you the result that you want to get uh, going forward. Commissioner Hamley. Yeah, I, I really appreciate your perspective. I think um, as a small business owner, you probably have much more experience than I do. I, I, I guess I take issue with Commissioner Yin's point. I, I, I hear how much you care about that's downtown and, and the fear that perhaps administrative offices could one day open. What I think we forget is a lot of the comments today are also about sustainability, and we want people to be able to work near transit. And I'm not saying that's, you know, we want all offices in downtown, but, I mean, there is Jane Jacobs and Eyes on the Street, right? People have to work somewhere, right? And we don't know what the future of work is going to look like, and we don't know how often people are going to be coming. So I guess my point is really, let's not take a tool out of our toolbox. We can absolutely be careful and, and have really prescriptive, you know, intention of here's what we're trying to achieve, because you're right. And some people will say it's worth it for me to, some landlords will say it's worth it for me to take the hit because I know that I could eventually get a higher rent by waiting it out. And I think what I'm what I'm most concerned about is long term vacancies where there isn't the tool if the conditions change and we've spent this time on a precise plan and we don't have a tool in our toolbox to say that under certain conditions we can make it by exception, right? That 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 it would be considered. I, I just don't love the idea of banning it all altogether because there are some small administrative buildings that do I mean there are insurance offices that have people coming in and out, right? There are, there are types of administrative uses that can be small businesses that can bring people to and from, but it just, it seems a little too extreme to say we're not going to have some condition where this could be considered. And it, it, I understand that the, the WhatsApp building has a long history to it, but the small business owners aren't going to be able to pay the retail rents. And if we don't have some kind of anti-displacement policy that allows them to figure out how we can pair businesses that are at risk of losing their current commercial lease to a new building that's going up that has to find ground floor retail, that also seems like an missed opportunity. So I, I mean, I'm really excited that John Ling is joining, joining the city and that we can have a, a robust conversation. Economic development is not the purview of this commission, right? The downtown committee does this. The city council is doing this. I think the recommendations that we're making are really about land uses. And if the land uses, we're saying the commission really feels uncomfortable with administrative uses, period, that's, that's not where I feel comfortable landing. And I would not want my opinion to be reflected in that way. Um, and so so I, I understand if others have different points of view. Uh, yes, well, the question was posed to us, so that's why I'm, I'm answering it. Um, even if it's not the purview of the EPC, it was brought to us to answer. Um, and I, I fear that maybe you misunderstand what I had said, um, because I am talking literally just ground floor use. I didn't say no offices. If we look at that map, we have more office than restaurants, square footage wise. So that I'm not saying no administrative office in downtown. I agree. Jane Jacobs, I thought most of her books, read them, went to school studying her. Um, I'm talking about ground floor use, which is the public realm, in a sense, for downtown. So when you're walking down the street, if Castro had no shops and all offices, it's not a main street, it's an office park. Most people wouldn't be there except for those who worked in the offices. I'm not talking about second floor, fourth floor. It is ideal to have a mix of uses in a downtown. I am talking about the ground floor. That is part of the public realm and what activates the street. And again, just go on a Saturday and take a look with the intention of where the most activity is and why. And you will see it is in the use, it is in the scale, and it is in the public realm design. So there are blocks where it's just office I would say you're going to get a very small percent of people walking that block or going in and out of those buildings versus those 
first three blocks south of the train station. And there's a reason, it's the land use on the ground floor. So for me, administrative office, like headquarters stuff, no. Again, I will say personal services, I'm open to it. There are ones that can just, you know, take a little shop front. They take people in and out. There's a lot of service, very valuable. I say it could be limited. Maybe we should take a look and do what we can to get what is ideal first. And then take a look at what that limitation in the personal services is, because through stakeholder meetings, community meetings, the public has expressed a strong desire for as much retail. In fact, they're calling for high-end retail. It's difficult. We all know that. Amazon, all the other mail orders. Um, but let, let's try for the ideal first. Um, and I understand you're saying, don't take a tool out of the toolbox. Well, I'll say one of these tools is going to kill the downtown, potentially. I don't mean to, to be draw, dramatic about it. And I think that language is harmful. I don't think that helps the conversation because what we're trying to imagine is what one person's ideal is different, right? This is why it's a citizen body so that we can have these conversations and say, well, what could one person's ideal be versus, you know, what are the all the options? So I, I fully understand your point and I, I appreciate where you're coming from. I, but I... I I think it's an exaggeration to say that offices on the ground floor would kill downtown. I think that's an exaggeration from my point of view, and I don't want my comments to be reflected in that way in the recommendation by council. That's fine. I'm not disrespecting your opinion. You're entitled to your opinion. I am not saying that. Um... <sighs> well, I'm sorry. Right. I just, you know, we'll carry on. That my point has been made, and if um, you know, we can define downtown. I think. Staff might even have an opinion on, on that. They have given their opinion. So um, I'm just going to say I agree with their opinion to say no to admin administrative offices. And yes, let's be more flexible and open it up to personal service type offices and perhaps limit that. Do what we can to incorporate what is ideal based on community outreach, the public, and yes, my personal view. Um, I think we understand, Commissioner Ian. So I, if I... We're, we're a little more divided on this one. If I can uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think what I heard was one clear no, um, two clear yeses, and then from Commissioners Dempsey, Schneezing, Caprillus, and Lowe, a yeah, but I don't want to kill the, you know, if it's vacant for a long time, I'm open to being flexible to have approach. Is so the timing how quickly it may be put in place would be a factor in whether you might support it or not support it when it came back for the next time. Is that a fair statement? I'm seeing one, yeah, kind of sort of, is that low? Is that where you are as well? You're in a, okay. So, and they weren't clear yeses or noes from the other four. It was kind of a, yeah, I maybe prefer that, but it really depends on how it gets implemented and what the economy's like and, so there's no, you don't have a clear vote on four of them. I know Eric and uh, and Edgar, that's not exactly what you prefer to hear, but uh, that's why I'm here. Um, yeah, I mean, I did I did hear a, quite a few of those people saying that they agreed with Commissioner Haymeyer. Um, and so maybe just kind of clarifying that, um, you know, agreeing that basically, um, uh, what I heard was that uh, Commissioner Haymeyer proposed this kind of um, uh, uh, nuanced approach to try to uh, look for ways that you can support both reduced vacancy with this tool in your toolbox. You, she talked about potentially having a timeline um, standard. I don't know if she's wedded to that, but you know, one of these things that's like um, keeping the tool in your toolbox just to kind of limit vacancy and give options to uh, to property owners over time. Um, and so I feel like that was kind of agreed by um, Commissioner Schmizing, Caprillus, and Dempsey. Um, and uh, and so it'd be good to get that confirmation. Clarify, what I heard was you would not put you would not remove them at registered offices as a provisional use period. Is that correct, Commissioner Hammond? 
So reading the staff, the way I read the, the question that was presented to staff, from staff was if the staff recommendation is to prohibit administrative office use from parts of Area H under all circumstances. So I think right. it would be some kind of provisional criteria TBD, but allowing a provisional administrative use with a nuanced approach of understanding Certainly, we can do community engagement. I mean, we're very early in the precise plan. We do community engagement for a living. Like, I, there should need to be a citizen process for this. But yes, having uh, having set criteria that would allow us to see where there could be an, a, a provisional use that meets certain criteria to reduce vacancies in the downtown. I, I don't know okay. if it has to be a time horizon. I, I think all of that is is at a level of detail I'm just not able to present tonight. But the concept of Eric that outlined is right on. Krishna Kapoor, are you in the same place, or what I, maybe I misunderstood? No, that's okay. It's it's just that I I really wanted to introduce some flexibility for you know the staff to you know be able to work with, and I I would leave it up to the staff to determine what what would make sense because we don't know what. Uh, landlords or uh, owners are going to come and and propose, but I think the you know the general idea of you know activity on the first floor, yes, but we've got to be a little bit flexible. Us, I think we're all very you know concerned about the the vacancies downtown, and that's kind of where we are coming from. So you know I. I would want to just maintain that flexibility. So it's not one way or another. I just think it's important to have that uh, ability to be flexible in whatever way that makes makes sense. I mean, we need to base that on what other um, other cities have tried and it didn't work. Or you know, I'm not sure exactly where we would come up with. Uh, exactly a, a tier level and what that would look like but i think the flexibility is important so you would keep it you would keep it as a professional use commissioner Dempsey? yeah as a as a resident of the mushy middle here i just wanted to clarify my lack of clarity um commissioner haymeyer and caprillas i think said very well i think kind of how i was feeling um you know, I do think we need to have multiple kind of tools to work with here. Um, and I would love to see what staff might be able to come back with about how we would recommend that to council and whatnot. Uh, you know, having said all that, I actually think, you know, Commissioner Yin's position on this is where we should end up ultimately. Um, I think that if we really want this active, vibrant, beautiful downtown that everybody wants to hang out with, which I want to do that too, ultimately it does make sense to have ground floors that are activated and you want to walk in and you can do things. That does make sense. Um, so just for what it's worth, I guess I want to agree with everybody. Um, but I, I don't feel like I can get there quite yet, but I hope that we can. And if we're doing more work on how to get to filling all those empty offices, then I would feel much more comfortable saying, you know, there's a smaller range of things that are allowed here because there's so many people that want in. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Lowe. Thank you. Um, yes, ground floor um, administrative office is my least favorite type of use, um, but I am hesitant in saying we have to remove it precisely because of all the vacancy that we're facing. Um, so oh. I'm reluctantly saying perhaps let's keep it there as a last resort. But ideally, no, I, I don't want to see that in down, you know, uh, ground space, ground, ground level spaces. And Commissioner Schmeezing? Yeah, so we, what, what Vice Chair Lowe said. It's not an endorse, like a ringing endorsement of administrative office on the ground floor, but I don't feel comfortable taking it out um, of the picture completely just yet. So I think that's clear now, Eric and Edgar. Okay. Um, so those were our three questions. Um, I would, uh, I guess, I think 
any other last you know last items that the commissioners would want to just kind of as feedback to staff or to council um as they as you kind of talk through this we certainly have talked about you know supporting looking at the green spaces i think i heard from several folks as a phase two um anything any other uh, any other comments huh well, maybe Phase two, Chair Cranston, if we could make a request to staff, I think it would be helpful if we could either have Tiffany or John or someone come and share a little bit more about what the downtown committee has been doing, what the other economic development strategies are, just some understanding how that interacts would be really helpful. And I know um, it's, it'll be a, a new addition for John to join the team, but I think that could be really valuable to inform this conversation moving forward as we look at the future phases. You know, hopefully we've got some more visibility on things like parking, downtown parking, and transit center, and those kind of things as well. Uh, Commissioner Capillas? Um, I, would, I would really second that request because I think this is part of what has been kind of a hard challenge for me personally tonight was there are so many parallel projects, you know, kind of surrounding this downtown area it's it's really hard to kind of put our stake in the ground for our piece of it when we don't know what the other pieces are doing so that would be extremely helpful and educational for for me to be able to be uh you know a little bit more um educated if you will to, to know exactly what we're working with so transit center and you know the the uh pedestrian mall and you know that whole area that that many of us are working on would be helpful for us for our knowledge to to be able to address that All right then we will no other comments we'll move on to item six commission staff announcements update requests and committee reports any updates here Next meeting, for example. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I did just send out an email to the commission today about um, a grand opening for the Life Moves Mountain View project, uh, the Project Home Key project. This is an uh, uh, interim housing community with 100 units on Leghorn. Uh, so you're invited to watch that. Uh, kind of exciting that it's opening up right now. Um, I did want to, just with the connection to downtown, remind everybody that um, Council is going to be discussing the downtown parking strategy next week. Um, and so you tune into that and, and get an understanding of where that conversation is going. And it could, um, you know, it probably more inform phase two discussions, but it could also help, um, uh, you know, give you an idea of where the city is going on that important issue. Um, the next EPC meeting scheduled for May 19th. Uh, we are expecting a public hearing uh, for the 400 Logue project. That's a multifamily housing project in East Wisman. Um, and uh, so that, that's gonna happen. Um, we actually don't have any other items scheduled through the summer, so throughout June. Um, I'm, uh, you know, something may come up um, so we're, we're not going to cancel the meetings yet, but I did want to let you know that uh, at this point we don't have any other meeting, any other items scheduled for June. I thought the North Bay Shore Gateway was coming back. Uh, not, we, not, we had to push it out because of CEQA. We have to do a little more CEQA analysis, so um, that's going to be probably first thing after summer. Uh, Commissioner Capellas, do you have an announcement? Um, I actually have a question. I have my ethics proof of participation certificate, and I want to know where should I send that, and do you want it signed? Um, you know what? You, you sent that to me through email, and I, it's been on my to-do list to try to track, track down exactly what we do with those things. I apologize for the delay on that, Commissioner. And I know I, you're a busy man. Don't worry, Eric. I'll talk to you on that as soon as I can. 
And, nope. and if there, if it is something that all the commissioners have to do, I'll, I'll be sure to send out an email. That'll be great. Thank you so much. And I was, I guess, the just a question for Eric or Sandy or anybody on staff. Um, I have my two shots. Um, has there been any discussion um, at the city level as to when these change from these wonderful Zoom meetings to actually being able to see each other face to face again? <laughs> um, I know there are discussions. I'm actually not part of those discussions. I'm sure that that's happening kind of at the clerk level and you know in, in the kind of more administrative level. Um, so, but that's a, that's a great question, and I think you guys deserve to know kind of what's what's in store for this commission, you and the public. Um, I do think that the public there is a benefit to the public being able to tune in from their you know their home desks uh, and be able to to provide comment. And and I don't so I don't know what may end up happening with that if we do go back to city hall um, for these meetings. Hmm. I can just add that there's um there you know there's still it legislation that's pending um and it's you know I think being amended it's it's not static so it's not certain how that is going to shake out yet and also there are things like um the you know the existing county health orders that still um would not necessarily allow for us to all be in the same room together and with a lot of members of the public. So there are certain things that need to be navigated. And um, and so those those conversations are only beginning. All right, thank you. And now there are announcements from folks. OK. And um, we will adjourn the Environmental Planning Commission meeting May 5th at 9.57 p.m. And we'll see everyone in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good night.